This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. The African bush, beautiful but savage. Get into trouble here. And if the heat doesn't kill you, the neighbors will. When a conservationist crashes his plane in this bone-dry environment, he suffers massive internal injuries and has to use every ounce of his strength, knowledge, and determination to keep both his mind and his body in one piece. How a split second changed one man's dream into his worst nightmare on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Zimbabwe, Southern Africa. Most of us could only hope to experience this wild, dangerous place as tourists. But for wildlife conservationist Greg Rasmussen, its home and the office all rolled into one amazing experience. I've always been passionate about wildlife from day one. I mean, even as a child. I love the bush. I love Africa. It holds an endless fascination. I mean, it's it never, it's always changing and there's just so much to learn. It's like a book that just never ends. Although he was born in England, Greg has lived in Africa since he was a boy and has spent the last 12 years working to save a rare species, the painted dog, from the brink of extinction. Conservation had always been a part of me. I found that dream, that passion to actually do something where I felt I could make a difference. Greg's assistant is fellow Brit, Peter Blinston. Together they run the Painted Dog Conservation Project. Greg's a very single-minded, very determined guy. Totally committed to saving this uh, species. And that passion is something that we share. If you are capable of doing something and making a difference, then you do it, I think, or I do. But that's just me, that's the way I operate. When it comes to wildlife, Greg is always ready to help. So when a call comes in from fellow conservationists trying to find a lost rhino, he agrees to assist in the search. He's a pilot and plans to use his organization's aircraft, a single-engine ultralight, to locate the animal. Trouble is, flying and tracking at the same time is a tricky business. I had a really uncomfortable feeling with it. He didn't have enough experience to go and do this. It's not safe. Peter said, you know, you shouldn't be doing flying. You know, you're the head of this operation, you know. We sort of can't afford to lose you. I mean, maybe it was a premonition. The rhino was last spotted in a region of tough, broken bush, quite a contrast to the flat local territory. That area is quite hostile, and it's a different terrain. It's very harsh, very, very rough African landscape. And I was aware of that. I was fully aware of that. But then we had rhinos that needed locating. There were poachers out there. I mean, you can't turn your back. And I couldn't, and I wouldn't, and I never will turn my back on such a thing. The flight gets off to a good start. It was 
quite amazing to be flying over the African bush. Because it is so rich and so diverse. You know, whether it's the bigger animals, the mammals, but, you know, right down to the sort of the insects and the butterflies. You know, every, there is just so much there all the time. It's mind-blowing. Although it's July and the middle of winter, soon it will be over 100 degrees. The intense heat and the resulting thin air make it far from ideal flying conditions. So it's quite hard keeping the plane up in the air. Because, you know, it's hot, the air's thin. Tricky flying conditions for, for a light aircraft. As his search gets underway, the rhino is nowhere to be found. And Greg is forced to look further and further afield. I've never flown that area before. And I realised I was in a completely different territory. I mean, this was a very harsh, dry, rocky, rugged area. The rhino is electronically tagged, and tracking it from the air requires flying at altitudes of up to 10,000 feet. Fifteen minutes into the flight, Greg picks up the rhino signal and descends to make a visual ID. And I just found it. And I was just starting to circle out. And as I turned the plane, Suddenly I went into something known as a wing storm. As Greg makes the turn, the inside wing is traveling more slowly than the outer one, and the airflow over it begins to break up into turbulence. Almost instantly, the wing stops generating lift, with disastrous results. I had this gut-wrenching feeling. It was terror. And the plane started to go down in a, in a spiral. And the ground were coming up pretty damn fast. Greg just doesn't have the altitude to correct the spin, and the plane plummets to the ground at 120 miles per hour. And then there's a split second. You know you pass the point of any return. I knew that if you crash, the likelihood of survival is nil. Greg Rasmussen is alive after crashing his plane in the middle of an African game reserve, but just barely. I almost didn't want to open my eyes. I didn't know what I was going to see, what I was going to feel, what I was going to find. I was totally dazed, stunned, and I was like, I'm alive. I'm alive. And at that second, petrol started dripping over me. And I just pulled myself out, literally almost fell out of the plane. With gasoline everywhere, fire is his greatest fear. I just had to get away from this thing. And I knew my legs were doing nothing. They, they couldn't, I, I couldn't do anything with the legs at all. But I just had to get away from this plane. I mean, this thing was a nightmare now. I felt I was slightly at least at a safe distance from this plane, you know, from the potential fire. Oh, you idiot. And then I suddenly thought, 
Mayday. I've got to call Mayday. The plane is a ticking firebomb. But the radio on board might still work. No one knows where he is or that he has crashed and is severely injured. He has to try to make a call. And I remember being totally terrified to drag myself back to that plane. The whole plane now became to me an object of terror. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Mayday, Mayday! But the radio is no use at all. The whole handset was hot because the crash had short-circuited all the batteries and had literally fried my only means of survival, the radio, the emergency radio. And I thought, I've dragged myself back into this hell for nothing. Well, this is no good. I've got to get away from this plane. I've got to get as far away from this plane as I possibly can. And then the pain hit. Until now, Greg's pain has been masked by hormones released into his system as part of his body's response to trauma. But these natural painkillers can only work for so long. And now, Greg can feel the damage that's been done. That pain, that was a pain that I'd never experienced before. Anything like it, anything that even came close to it. I then knew when I was dragging, my feet were just doing this. My legs were just one big lump of jelly. Nearly every bone in Greg's legs and feet are broken. He's bleeding internally due to massive injuries and has already lost two quarts of blood. Another quart and he will be unconscious and close to death. I literally like a tortoise but on its back started to paddle with my arms, one after the other and paddled myself back as far as I possibly could. The situation is critical. All around are animals that could kill him. Scorpions, snakes, elephants, lions, hyenas. Death could come from any direction, and there's little hope of any rescue. If I was gonna get out of this, it was only gonna be me and me alone. Conservationist Greg Rasmussen has been lying virtually paralyzed with pain for over half an hour since crashing his plane in the African bush. I knew quite clearly that every single thing I did was going to count towards whether I made it or whether I didn't. There was this pain in my ankles. They felt like they were going to explode because I'd got these boots on. Yeah, and of course, there was no space for the swelling to go. There was no way I could even get anywhere near my shoelaces. But I was thinking, if I don't get those boots off, there's going to be gangrene, and I, I'm going to lose my feet. Greg is worried that the blood flow in his shattered legs has been cut off, and if he doesn't act soon, the tissue will die. Amputation is then the only option. I was just lying on my back and I could hardly focus my eyes because of the pain. I managed to look back and I thought, well, maybe if I can drag myself to this tree, I can tilt my body forward so that I can maybe get to my shoelaces. I wanted to stop that pain. It was like my foot was exploding. 
and I pushed myself up and started to try and balance myself on the tree. It was an irony, the only tree in the whole flipping area, and it, it's a thorn tree, and it's you know, stabbing me in the back. And I lay there, and all I could think of was, if I don't win this one, I'm going to lose my legs. If I lost my legs, to me, life wouldn't be worth living. The prospect of losing not just his legs, but his whole way of life, forces Greg to come up with a plan, however desperate. I felt this thorn tree, and I thought, well, it's got thorns on it, I can use this. And I managed to just break a twig off, and it got a hooked thorn on the end of it. I started to pick the shoelace. for the bush, you wear good boots, and they're all tied up, and even double bowed to make it really secure so they're not gonna catch on anything. <laughs> pull by agonizing pull, Greg manages to loosen the knots, but that, is just the start. Oh. I thought that somehow that I was going to feel some, something better, but of course shoelaces don't immediately open. Yes. The boots remain absolutely solid on my feet. And I realized then I had to pick the shoelace eye by eye by eye through every single eyelid. And I sat there with the stick, and I was just picking one by one. I had to remain as focused as I could. I'd overcome this pain to do this job. But I finally got to the point where the shoelace was free. And I was thinking immediately I was going to get pain relief. But all that happened was, was the swelling just filled the shoe completely. It was that tight. And all the time, all I'm thinking of is if I don't get those boots off, they're going to cut my legs off. Now, Greg needs something bigger to push the boots off his swollen feet. I saw a stick, and that was all there was. I thought, well, I'll go for that. And as I even just touched the shoe, yes! the pain was just, it was terrible. And I thought, oh my God. And now I've got to push this. And I mean, absolutely bizarre, you know, then I had a flashback to a movie. It was a John Wayne movie, you know. Oh, well, you bite on that while I cut this. stick was just rotten, full of termites. And my mouth was now even drier than before, and I went, Pff, but I pushed with such force that the shoe came off, and I just forced the other shoe off. And I looked at my watch, and it had taken me two and a half hours. Oh. It's a hundred degrees in the midday sun and Greg Rasmussen has been lying out, exposed for over three hours. 
he is parched from lack of water and beginning to feel the effects of dehydration. Back at base, Peter Blinston is getting anxious. I was expecting Greg back. I was looking at my watch, so I was conscious of the time. And I was getting more anxious because it was just taking too long. Peter, phone call please. The phone rang. I just felt nervous. This kind of sense of, you know, I, something's, something's wrong. Yeah, Peter. People talk about this kind of cold hand or something that grips you, but I really did just go like icy cold. And I'd said, you're gonna kill yourself in this plane. And I just thought, this has really happened now, almost like I'd predicted that it would. It was hot and it was dry. There wasn't an ounce of moisture in the air. I hadn't drunk the whole day because an elephant had destroyed the water pipes in our area. It wasn't like feeling thirsty at all. It was almost like being tortured. Everything was just so dry and your skin just didn't feel like skin anymore. There was no texture to anything. Directly exposed to the sun, Greg is dehydrating at a dangerous rate. Losing up to two pints of water an hour, if he doesn't act soon, he could be dead before sundown. And that's if the neighbors don't get him first. As I lay there, I remember there was a tree, sort of one of these almost a dead tree. And vultures came down and just landed on it. And I thought, not yet. Yeah, I'm not ready for you, mate. And I was lying there listening to the petrol of the plane. It was tormenting me. It was just like, I'm here, and don't try and come near me. I'm going to blow. Greg will soon be hallucinating as his body is virtually cooking in the heat. His blood pressure is falling, his pulse quickening, and he's getting dizzy. He knows he has to get out of the sun right now. It was scorching hot. And I looked at the plane, and that wreckage was the only bit of shelter in the whole area. And I thought, fire or no fire, I've got to get back, and I've got to face that plane again. I knew I had to get back to the plane because of the dehydration but also predators. The wreckage will not only provide vital shade, but it could also protect him from the eyes of vicious animals. So even though the plane might explode at any moment, it's still his best bet. Every single movement was terrible, but I realized that it was that or die, and that or fry up in the, fry in the heat. I tried to pull, and I had no more energy. I've got no power anymore to pull on my back. Totally exhausted, once again, Greg's understanding of animals offers a glimmer of hope. And I suddenly thought, flashback to one of my zoology lessons, talking about locomotion in reptiles. A crocodile crawls like that. If I can be on my stomach, it's gonna cost me about a third of the energy to go the same distance. I thought, how am I going to roll over? How? Because, you know, the legs were just jelly. And I had two shoelaces and a stick, and I thought, well, that's what I've got to play with. I made a loop on the end of one shoelace and tied it onto the end of this stick. I hooked the stick underneath my leg. And I knew that this was going to be one very, very painful experience. I almost had the fear of pain before it came. Just as I rolled, I heard a crack.
It wasn't the stick, it was my pelvis was broken. Despite his terrible injuries, Greg Rasmussen is attempting to drag himself into the shade of his crashed aircraft. And as if things weren't bad enough, his life is being threatened by the very thing he loves the most. Being in the bush for so many years, you get to know absolutely every single noise out there. You know every footfall. You know which footfall belongs to which animal. I was terrified that maybe something would come and sneak up on me. And I couldn't do anything, you know, I mean, I couldn't run. And then I heard elephants. And I thought, don't panic, no panic, you mustn't panic, because you'll die. They were coming directly towards me and they got louder and louder. This time, Greg's knowledge offers him little comfort. He knows all too well how dangerous elephants can be. If they detect you at the right moment, that's fine. If they detect you too late, that's the scary bit. Because then you're in their attack distance. And I thought, if the wind is wrong and they don't detect me until the very last minute, that's when I'm in trouble. I could hear the suction of air because they were sniffing. And then suddenly there was this huge screech of... I remember just thinking, oh no, please, just don't stampede. And I just had this absolute fear that I'm going to be trampled. Much to Greg's relief, the elephants sense something unusual in their path and retreat. I wanted to cry at this point, and I realized then that I couldn't have cried even if I wanted to. There was no moisture for me to expend on tears. In the African bush, when the word goes out that someone is missing, everybody stops what they're doing to lend a hand in the search. Time is critical. The bush is an even more dangerous place after nightfall. I was sure that he was alive, but you know that you've not got much time. Almost as each minute passes by, of course, you're becoming more and more concerned. How many are out looking? Uh, about 15. Our rangers, local farmers, pilot from Victoria Falls, came up in his Cessna. Now I was thinking, we have to find him. Even if you've survived the crash, there's animals, there's wildlife that can kill him. The chances of him surviving are getting slimmer and slimmer. The search begins at the last known sighting of the missing rhino. But unfortunately, the search party has no idea where Greg or the rhino are now. Finally, Greg makes it to the shade of the gasoline-soaked aircraft. But his bad day at the office is about to get even worse. I heard footfall. It was lion footfall. And I listened very, very carefully, and, and it was getting closer and closer. And then I heard this call. It was a lioness. And lionesses have a very distinctive call they use when they're calling cubs. And obviously, because she was a mother with cubs, that makes her far more dangerous. Facing an encounter with Africa's most feared predator, Greg adopts a strategy he's observed in the wild. Animals under threat will, at the last possible moment, make a sharp, sudden noise to scare off their enemy. 
As the lioness moves in closer, Greg knows what he has to do. It came closer and closer to the point that I saw this silhouette. And that was the trigger that I had been waiting for. The search is now six hours old, and Greg hears the sound of an engine, but he can't see the plane, and the plane can't see him. It's yet another source of torment. There was this desperate frustration of, A, the uncertainty of whether they were even looking for me, and B, every noise I heard seemed to be in the wrong place. And then this total sort of helplessness, how can I let you know? I mean, I can't go out and run, and I'm, I'm, I'm crippled here. The sound of the plane fades away, leaving nothing but the dreadful prospect of a night alone in the bush. Nothing is going to happen now until tomorrow morning, at the very earliest. And of course, as a biologist, you know the night is a, always a dangerous time anywhere. <laughs> And then something happened that literally just changed almost everything. My muscles in my upper legs started to go into involuntary contractions. And as they contracted, all these smashed shards of bone were stabbing my muscles from inside. My legs felt like they were going to explode from within. The reduced blood flow in his legs has caused a buildup of lactic acid in Greg's muscles. This causes spasms, which he is powerless to stop, producing wave after wave of agony. And there was nothing, there was nothing in the world that ever prepared me for something as violent and as terrible as that. Greg Rasmussen has been missing in the bush for nearly 12 hours. Although he survived the worst day of his life, his worst night is still to come. The contractions have died down now. And I thought about my life. I thought, do I really want to carry on? And I realized that that was a decision I had to make. Did I want to live or did I want to die? And I thought, well, I've had a good life. I was suddenly, for a very short period of time, I was at total peace with myself. I realized that I had it in me, the power, to just switch off and just let myself go. And then I suddenly thought, but there's a hell of a lot more I can do. And from that second, it was like, right, the fight is on. At that point, there was just such a kick in me that, that it was like, I'm going for it, and I'm going to make it. And I'm not going to... If I go, if I do die, I'm going to die fighting this right to the bitter end. As night falls, the search party returns to base. But Greg's friend Peter Blinston carries on looking. The night comes on very quickly in Africa. Darkness kind of overtakes you. But I was trying to picture how terrifying, really, it would be even for somebody like Greg. Knowing what's out there, knowing the predators are going to start to become more active and is now lying there very vulnerable. You would almost wish that he were dead and you know, not have to face a night like that.
All I wanted now was for that night to end. I wanted that night just to go away. And I just kept looking at my watch, thinking it must be at least three o'clock now. And it was one o'clock in the morning. And I felt I'd been there all night. After an unsuccessful search in the dark, Peter returns to base to find everyone pessimistic about Greg's chances of survival. They uh, don't think there's any point in him going out again tomorrow. I was thinking about what they were saying, and for a moment, you know, thinking maybe they're right. But I wouldn't hear that. Greg wouldn't give up. He's a stubborn bugger. And neither will I. I wouldn't give up until I found him. I'll talk to the pilot and the others, see if they can give us another morning at least. Thanks. As the hours pass, Greg does his best to hold on, but he's alone, injured, and it's dark. Mentally, I knew I was going downhill. All I was thinking was sunrise, please come. I want that sun to come up. Then I heard my worst nightmare. <laughs> Hyenas have a very, very distinctive footfall. You can't mistake it. And I thought, it's coming behind me. Right in the worst spot, it's gonna come round the back, which is where I really had absolutely no control. Hyenas are hunters and scavengers capable of eating every part of an animal, even the teeth. I know what hyenas are capable of. Bone crushers, as they're also known. They've got the most powerful jaws of anything. At that point, it was like, I mustn't crack. I can't crack now. And I heard this footfall come closer and closer. Greg's only hope is that the strategy that worked against the lioness will work against the hyena. I knew I had to do it at the very, very last possible moment. <laughs> and I waited until it seemed like forever. And then I heard this like footfall just getting less and less and less. And I heard it no more. I remember lying there at that particular point thinking, is there anything else that's gonna be chucked at me? You know, what, what else is gonna come? You know, what other bricks gonna come down? I was mentally totally exhausted. Peter spends a sleepless night just before dawn, the search party gets ready to resume the search. I watched, looking for the sun to come over the horizon. It was an amazing experience. I suddenly felt wonderful, like I was being bathed in light and heat and warmth. I felt secure for a moment. And then the harsh reality dawned on me that it was that sun, that burning, it was going to continue and it was going to kill me. At first light, the search resumes, this time over a wider area. Norman and Peter, can you read me? Over. Receiving. Uh, there's nothing from up here. We're going to try another area. Over 24 hours is an incredibly long time to be lying out there in the bush. I was beginning to doubt if he'd survived. Desperate for water, Greg is willing to try anything, however unlikely. I managed to grab a piece of the broken windscreen. I had this mad idea to see if it would collect moisture. And then I heard this plane. A 
Around 10.30 a.m., 27 hours after Greg crashed his plane, the park warden spots a glint of light on the ground. It's the wreckage. Mayday, mayday, all search parties have located the wreckage 40 miles south of the main search area. Greg does his best to hold on to hope that the plane he hears is coming for him. We can't land, I repeat, we can't land, we're gonna have to go by road. I felt numb. I wanted to see what was there. I wanted to see Greg. I wanted to just get to the site. I was really afraid. You're just thinking, okay, we found him, but we don't know what we found yet. No sign of Greg. And you're imagining all sorts of horrors. I got to the point where I nearly went over the edge. And I suddenly came to this horrible realization that if they didn't find me soon, I was going. And then I heard these footfalls. God, <sighs> of course, I knew what footfalls those were. And among them was Peter. And I suddenly looked and I couldn't believe it, that was him. I couldn't even speak to anybody, and uh, people were just saying what happened, and I just had to say, wing, stall, and that's all I could say. He just looked at me and tried to smile, and I was just like, like he's alive, you know, he's alive, I can't, but this is, you know, how, he's a, it's incredible, how can he be alive? It was really overwhelming. Mm. He'd survived. And it was sort of affirmation of my belief in him. Greg wouldn't give up. He was too stubborn. <coughs> the feeling that I wasn't going to die was just indescribable. All my fighting over the last day and a half had been worth it. And someone put their hand on my shoulder and said, you're in safe hands now. I'd fought this and I'd won. Since the accident, Greg Rasmussen has endured dozens of operations to save his legs, which are now three inches shorter. He has had to learn to walk all over again and soon hopes to return to work full time. Peter Blinston continues to save the painted dogs.